We are uh, going to tackle Matthew 9 tonight, but uh, as I usually do, um, I, I'm going to backtrack a little bit because this is a set. This is a, Matthew is presenting chapters 8 and 9 uh, together as a whole um, argument. So we're coming out of 5 through 7, the discourse in 5 through 7. We've got two chapters, 8 and 9, and then in chapter 10 we head back into a discourse uh, on discipleships uh, for his 12 disciples. So if you remember from last week, I suggested to you that Matthew 8 and 9 was structured in what way? Do you remember? I said there was, it, it was about miracles. We know that. It's just, and if you just happen to read through it, you might think this is a random bunch of miracles that Matthew is recording here. But if you take a look at it in a little more detail, Matthew has three sets of three miracles, each of which is followed by a call to discipleship. Okay? I mentioned that last week. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on what he's trying to accomplish, Matthew, in his presentation of this. And you might wonder, why is Pastor Greg saying Matthew is accomplishing this and not Jesus is accomplishing this? Well, ultimately, it's Jesus that's doing these things, right? So... Yes, that's true. But when we go and we find all of these miracles in other Gospels, we find them not lumped together like Matthew has done. We find them in some of the Gospels here and some of the Gospels there, the other synoptics, but they're not organized the same way. So the organization of these in three sets of three is a Matthew thing, okay? It's still a Jesus thing, but it's also a Matthew thing. Matthew is the author He's been given uh, the ability to organize these. And he has a purpose going in, and he's quite methodical about it. What was his, what's his profession? We know. He's a tax collector. He's a bean counter. He's a numbers guy, right? And so everything he does, the way he organizes things, is very methodical. And I, I hope by the end of tonight that you'll see that in a little more detail, but maybe a little more clearly. So we've got these three sections of three. We covered the first three miracles last week. I'm just going to briefly remind you what those are. There was a leper, if you remember. There was a centurion that came and had great faith. And a, a servant of his was healed. And then you have Peter's mother, who's sick with a fever. And I'm just going to propose to you that these first three... Oh, by the way, just... Just from an organization standpoint, if you've got three sets of three, what does that mean we have? It's an odd number, which gives us something in the middle. And if there's anything that I need to repeat over and over again, it's in biblical thought, in this time, people thought like they were working towards the middle. Okay, And that's where their central idea is. So if we've got three sets of three miracles, if you take those and put them flat, you've got three, three, and three, where are we going to find the central point? In the second set of three miracles, right? And that is true of this. So that's where we're headed. The first set, what, is the, uh, what does it accomplish? I'm going to suggest to you that Jesus is presented as the merciful Messiah, who heals every disease he encounters. He's healing in these first three. Who does he heal? He comes mercifully and touches a leper, someone that hasn't probably been touched for years. And Jesus mercifully touches the leper. The centurion, uh, not even a Jew, has great faith. And we find that Jesus' healing doesn't even require him to physically be there. He says a word. And remotely, people are immediately healed. And then sometimes even, <clears throat> people don't even ask to be healed. I don't know if you noticed this about Peter's mother-in-law. The way it's written, she didn't come to him and ask to be healed. Did you notice that? All the other circumstances, you've got people coming to Jesus. But Jesus walks into the house and it says he notices her and he heals her. And she gets up immediately and she's healed. Jesus, identifying himself as the Messiah, as a merciful Messiah, an anointed one of God, 
uh, Matthew combines these three healings into that first set. Okay? And that's what that's all review. That's what we covered last week. Uh, and uh, we're going to move on from there. We talked about uh, the call to discipleship. And so that's the second set. It's a set of three miracles. And I want to encourage you to, uh, oftentimes when we think about these miracles, we think about who the miracle is happening to. And that's got to be the central point. But I'm going to challenge you on these next three. So in Matthew 8, 25, um, or a little bit before that, they get into a boat and there's a great storm and Jesus is uh, asleep, right? And the disciples are freaking out, right? And they go and wake him up. And what does he do? His word calms the storm. This middle section, I'm going to challenge you to uh, think of this middle section as a presentation of Jesus' deity. Okay? In the first section, if he was presented as uh, the merciful Messiah figure and healing everyone that comes to him. Coming out of this middle section, this is the main point section, what Matthew wants you to know is who is Jesus, that he is able to do these things that we see. And so he gets into a boat and his words. Who do we find in this first miracle that is obeying his word? Is the focus on the disciples? No, it's not really. It's the physical realm of creation that obeys Jesus' words. Do you see that? Who is this man? <laughs> it's the question from the disciples that even the waves and the water obey him. What's the answer to that, by the way? Who has control of the creation? It's very God himself. Okay? It's an unspoken answer, but the question was asked, and that is the answer. So in this first miracle, in establishing Jesus' deity, what we see is Jesus speaks and the physical realm obeys his word. Okay? See that coming out of this? You could focus on the disciples and lack of faith and, you know, there's other things going on there. But this is the main thing. And then where do we go? We're in a boat and we're traveling across the Sea of Galilee. He lands in a Gentile place. So if we have three sets of three, and we're in that middle set, and this is the second of three miracles in the middle set, where are we? We're in the very center. So if there was something that, was, that I would suggest to you, if this thing is a real thing, this center thing, this chiastic structure thing, if it's a real thing, you would su I would suggest to you that we're gonna find something dramatically different here. Well, right off the bat, What's different about this miracle? It's the only of the nine that doesn't happen in the land of Israel. Did you notice where he's at? Where the, I mean, there's a demoniac, right? Where do the, pit, uh, where does the, where does the demons go into? Pigs. They go into pigs. What, what, is, what does that tell us about where we are? We are not in Israel anymore. These are not... Jewish people because Jews would never raise pigs okay we have stepped outside the land of Israel now in the first three we've got uh, Gentiles in the land of Israel we've got a centurion who's in the land of Israel and he's got great faith but here now we've stepped outside it's the only one of the nine where Jesus is outside the land of Israel you would expect the focus like the other synoptic gospels to be more on the man that's possessed because he's the one being healed. But do we find that here? There's really not any focus on the man at all. Who takes center stage? Who's the conversation between? It's between Jesus and the spiritual realm. What was the first miracle in this set of three? Jesus and the physical creation obeying his words. And we come out of the second miracle in a Gentile land where Jesus is identified. Did you notice that? If this middle section is to identify Jesus' deity, who identifies Jesus' deity here? Demons. It's the demons themselves, and what do they say about him? You are the Son of God. You are deity. 
And Jesus speaks a word to them, and do they have to obey him? Yes. There's a bit of back and forth, but they end up going, and they know they have to obey him. They know that is the case. So we come out of this middle miracle in a foreign land. It's also the only miracle, I don't know if you noticed this, it's also the only miracle where there's kind of a negative response. All the other people are amazed and they're wondering you know, who this man is and they're bringing more people to him. And What's the response here? Get out of here. We don't. So if Jesus is establishing his deity, if Matthew is trying to establish Jesus' deity by formulating these three sets of miracles together, he has Jesus travel outside just the land of Israel to visit the Gentile land as well. And it's there that Jesus' deity is first proclaimed, and it's by a demon in the spiritual realm. So in the, in the first two, what do you have? You've got Jesus giving a word and the physical creation obeys. You have Jesus giving a word and the spiritual creation obeys. And that leads us into this last one in this third set. And we're finally in chapter 9. Can you believe it? <laughs> Paralytic heal. Um, now, we're back in Capernaum now, so to get back on the boat, we're back in the land of Israel, okay? So that was a one and done, uh, that, that miracle with the demoniac there in a foreign land. We're back in Capernaum, and uh, a paralytic is brought to him, and Jesus heals him, does he not? But it's not as expected, right? This has really given us an insight into the healing ministry of Jesus. Um, oftentimes people say the most important thing is our physical healing. What's the problem with that? We all die <laughs> eventually. So even if we're made well today, Lazarus is a great example. Lazarus brought back from the dead. The uh, Bible's silent on this, but it's silent in a way that uh, presupposes that he dies again. Did you ever think about that? Lazarus is brought back from the dead, miraculous, showing the power of God, very God himself. And yet there's a point in the future when La he's not walking on the earth today, right? There's a point in the future that Lazarus dies again, which presupposes that our physical healing or all of these stories are secondary to something else that Jesus provides. And this is where he offers that perspective. Paralytic obviously needs some physical healing or could use some help, but Jesus doesn't offer that first. He offers the more important thing in his ministry, the thing that shows his deity. What does he say? Your sins are forgiven. Then there's some debate as to whether he can actually has the authority to do that. And so then he says, so that you know that I have the authority to do that, I will also do this. I'll show you in the physical realm that I have the power and authority so that you can also believe that in the spiritual realm of your spiritual lives, I also have the authority there. Uh, there's something very interesting going on here, and I won't spend too much time on it, but uh, I do want to mention it. The way Jesus says this, take courage in verse 2. Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. This, uh, this sounds pretty natural to us in the English, and the Greek uh, also reads fairly naturally, uh, but it's in the passive voice. The English and the Greek uh, languages use passive voice quite often. Your sins are forgiven you. He could have said uh, it in the first person. What would that have sounded like? God forgives your sins or I forgive your sins. That would be in the active voice, right? But Jesus says it in the passive voice, which again, sounds very natural to us, but interestingly enough, the passive voice in Hebrew is rarely used. So hearing this in a Hebrew context, this would have sounded very unusual. And in fact, it begs the question, what is Jesus doing here? Because 
he could have just very easily said in the active voice, I forgive you your sins, because that's really what is, what's happening. Well, if we go back into the Old Testament, specifically in the book of Leviticus, several places in Leviticus uh, 4, 5, and 6, and then again repeated in Numbers, there's a circumstance where in the Hebrew language, the verb of forgiveness is used in the passive voice. And it's in two places in the Old Testament, but it's talking about the same thing. Can you imagine what, what context in Leviticus and Numbers the term forgiveness by, might be used in the passive voice? It was in and around the temple. And specifically, it's, uh, the context is when some are, someone who has offered a sacrifice at the sanctuary, the priest is standing at the door. Now get the context of this. The priest is standing at the door when somebody is offered a sacrifice at the sanctuary, the temple. He's standing at the door, and it says that the priest will make atonement for him, and this is the way it's worded in the Hebrew, his sins will be forgiven him. It's in the passive voice. It's the only time the passive voice with the term forgiven is used in the Old Testament. Very rare in the Hebrew language would have been much more natural to use the active voice for Jesus. But when Jesus said it this way, what's the context? Well, let's not try and guess. Let's just look at the reaction. Take courage, son. Your sins are forgiven. And some of the scribes said to themselves what they say. This fellow blasphemes. What is blasphemy? It's when you claim to be deity, when you claim to be very God himself. Jesus says this very rare construction in the passive voice about forgiveness of sins, the scribes immediately connected it to Leviticus. But where are we? Are we in Jerusalem at the temple? Is Jesus a priest, considered a priest? <laughs> That's a loaded question, right? No, we're up in the Galilee region with a man who's not considered a priest. He's not in the priestly line, right? He's not considered a priest. And here he is saying in the same tone and language that the priests at the temple do, your sins are forgiven. And what's the message? I'm going to upset this whole thing. This whole thing is changing. It's not about being in a place. It's not about being uh, the descendant of somebody. Jesus is claiming his deity. Remember, we're still in the third set, or the, the middle set of three. This is the last of the three. So where have we been in these three? Where have we been? We've been with... Um, the calming of the storm, his word speaks, creation obeys, his word speaks, and the spiritual realm obeys, and then he speaks, and forgiveness is given. You come out of this middle section, Matthew expects you to be concluding that this Jesus is God, is very God himself. And just to Throw another thing in, Jesus down in verse 6 says, But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he says, pick up your mat and walk. So he heals him. If you're not familiar with this term, Son of Man, it was used earlier in our two-chapter set here. But do you know where the Son of Man term comes from? It's used in the Old Testament in a couple different places. Ezekiel is one. Prophet Ezekiel, the term is used for him. Daniel. But it's Daniel chapter 7. And I'm just going to take you there because this is significant enough in this third of three showing Jesus' deity. We go to G Daniel chapter 7. And in Daniel chapter 7, uh, the prophet is having a vision and his vision is not from earth, but his vision is from heaven itself. So Daniel is up in there in heaven. I kept looking at the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, 
one like a son of man was coming. This is where the son of man, it's a messianic term, but it's more than just Messiah. It's a deity term because look what happens. Daniel is in heaven, the clouds of heaven. He's looking down from heaven, seeing the cloud layer, okay? And he came up to the Ancient of Days. So one like the Son of Man was coming from somewhere else to the heavenly realm. And he came up to the Ancient of Days. That's God the Father, okay? And was presented before him. So this Son of Man is coming from somewhere else. He's presented before the Ancient of Days, the Father. And to him was given. To whom? To the Son of Man was given dominion, authority. Over what? He was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. So the Son of Man vision out of Daniel 7, when the Son of Man takes the throne and is given that kingdom, he is not just given the kingdom in heaven, but it is a kingdom that extends from heaven down to the physical realm and all the peoples and nations of every language will serve him. Jesus, in the third of three to establish his deity, says, let's go back, so that you may know that the Son of Man, Daniel 7, Son of Man, has authority on earth to forgive sins. What is Jesus claiming to be? Very God himself, in a very Jewish way. Daniel 7 is a very Jewish understanding, that Son of Man vision. It's an understanding of this is very God himself. He's not only the Son of God, but he is the Son of Man two separate terms used in the Old Testament. Some people think they're synonymous. Um, I've read enough that I, I'm pretty convinced that Son of God and Son of Man bring out different aspects of Jesus' deity. They're not synonymous, in other words, even though they might seem to be used that way in the Gospels. So we're done with the second set of three. What do we know about Jesus? He is our merciful Messiah who heals all who come to him, physically in this realm, but with this, your sins are forgiven you, what does that really mean that Jesus heals everyone who comes to him? Is it a physical healing? Is his ultimate ministry? No. What's his <coughs> ultimate ministry? It's to heal our souls. He's a merciful Messiah that will heal everyone's soul who comes to him. He is very God himself. And now let's enter into the last of these uh, set of three. And we're actually likely to get done with chapter 9 tonight. <laughs> Unbelievable, right? Um, notice the gospel or the discipleship call at the end of that second set. At the end of the first set, the discipleship call was kind of a negative thing. It was, uh, if you're my disciple, you're not going to have a place to lay your head, right? Remember that? And if... Uh, don't worry, you're going to have to reestablish relationships and let the dead bury their own dead. Those are the two negatives coming out of that first intersection of the discipleship call after the first set of three. Here, though, we have some positive discipleship call things. And I'm just going to uh, kind of summarize them. First, a tax collector can be a disciple. Well, that's kind of cool. That is a grace-filled message, is it not? Because tax collectors were not viewed very well, right? They were collaborators with the Romans. Um, tax collectors and sinners. They weren't even worthy of being called sinners, I guess. So, so not only was, is it kind of a positive thing that a tax collector, but there's also this thing about, question about fasting that's part of that uh, discipleship call at the end of the second set of miracles. And it's, it's this talk about new wineskins and new wine. And that we're kind of reaching the end of an old paradigm and we're coming into a new paradigm and this is going to be a new and better paradigm. And so these are kind of positive things. Okay, This is not an old thing that we're going to have to rehash. 
with all of its problems, but this is going to be a new thing, a new ministry. All right, let's jump into this last set. Um, this last set of three miracles, uh, I'm going to suggest to you that uh, it's just about the spread of the news about Jesus filling the land and beginning to cause division. And I'm, I'll talk to you about, uh, I'll, I'll show you as best I can um, what I mean by that. If we go back to the first set of three, the leper and <coughs> what were the first three? The leper, the centurion, and the mother-in-law. Those were those were all kind of in small groups. Remember we talked about the leper likely being by himself because Jesus says, go and don't tell anybody. Probably wasn't a huge crowd there. Probably wasn't a ginormous crowd in Peter's house with the mother-in-law, right? So those miracles at the first set but are, are, are likely smaller crowds. But here in this last set, what we see is the spread of the news of who Jesus is. These miracles are in bigger context. They're in larger groups of people, and there's actually some verbiage that uh, gives us uh, an idea. So this first miracle is the synagogue official uh, who came and whose daughter had just died. There is another miracle in the middle of this. It's the hemorrhaging woman. It's packaged together as one miracle, though, so that's some of you might have said, oh, I think there's four here. But the way it's packaged, and it's packaged this way in all the synoptic gospels, um, uh, this is really viewed uh, from a commentary standpoint. People are viewing this as a packaged deal. Uh, he's going to do a miracle, and this woman touches him along the way, so it's packaged within that. Okay, so that may have been a, a question or a thought some of you had. This woman, though, I just want to uh, focus on her a little bit. She comes up behind and touches the hem of Jesus' garment. Is that what it says? The fringe, uh, I think is what it says. The fringe of his cloak in my version that I have up here. She was saying to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be well. I want to uh, just give you a little bit of background. I've taught on this before in other settings, so this might be duplication for some of you. But the tassels on the corners of uh, the garments goes all the way back to Exodus when a gentleman, after the Sabbath had been um, prescribed, taking a day off, uh, a gentleman went out to collect sticks on the Sabbath. And um, it was not known what they should do with him. They brought him before uh, Moses. And Moses implied, uh, implored uh, God to communicate. The, end of the penalty was death, for the, which seems kind of severe. But coming out of that, what God gave to Moses was tell people to wear fringe on the corners of their garments. And the reason is because I don't want this to happen again. I don't want you to lackadaisically forget that we're in a covenant relationship with rules here that I hold very important. So when these tassels are on your garment and you walk around, if you've ever had tassels, some of you lived in the 70s, right? <laughs> okay. If you've walked around in that, you know that it's hard to forget that you've got tassels. It's a continual reminder that something's going on. So every time you walk, every time you move, these tassels also became um, some identification. So where do we see tassels in the Old Testament? When, when uh, Samuel and Saul, when Samuel goes to Saul and says, it's time, you're not going to be king anymore. Samuel gets up, the prophet gets up, and Saul grabs the tassel and rips it from trying to keep Samuel there, I think. This is the symbol of God's prophet. And Samuel says, in the same way that you've torn this tassel off, the kingdom is being torn from you. Where else have we seen tassels in the Old Testament? David and in Gedi. He's hiding in a cave, and Saul comes in to relieve himself and takes off his cloak, and David has a chance. It's a very odd passage if you don't understand the context. David comes up and cuts off the corner of his garment, which would have been the identifying mark of the king. There's no other tassel that is tied quite the same way as the king's tassel. It's an identification. So when David cuts that off, what's he doing? He had already been anointed. He's claiming authority. Right? And then his conscience, conscience strikes him. 
And he says, no, this is not my time, right? So there's other places uh, that talk about these tassels. But here you have a woman who comes up and touches Jesus's tassel. And her, she's saying to herself, if I only touch his tassel, I know that I will get well. Well, where is she coming up with this? Is she seeing everybody else? But nobody else has touched his tassel. He, he touches the leper. He speaks to the centurion about the servant. He's nobody else. Let me just toss this out to you as a little bit of background. In Malachi, it's the last book in the Christian Old Testament. The Jewish Old Testament is organized slightly differently. But in the last book, in the last chapter of the last book, there's... Um, there's, in verse 5 here, it says, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet coming before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Elijah the prophet, that's John the Baptist's ministry. So this is a scripture talking about the time of the arrival of John the Baptist, fulfilling the role of Elijah and Jesus. And right before that, it says, Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes which I commanded him. Um, I think I need to scroll up here. Yes, verse 2. But for you who, who fear my name, who is it that fears the name of God? True believers, right? The Pharisees don't fear the name of God. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness. Now this is S-U-N, so it's not S-O-N, but it is a messianic title. The son of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall, healing in his wings. Well, it's interesting, in the Hebrew language, if you have a, a garment with tassels and you raise your arms, it almost looks like wings. And so the, the, the words describing those garments is the corner and or, or is the same word as wings, okay? So you've got these tassels on the corners of your garments and in the last book of the Old Testament, the prophet says, for those of you who are believers, this character will show up about the same time as this character, this Elijah reappearing, and he will have healing in the corners of his garments, his tassels. And Jesus' tassel would be like no other tassel because it identifies him as the Messiah. I would just propose to you that this woman, having read her Old Testament, being a woman of faith, is walking up to Jesus. Having seen Jesus, having heard Jesus, is walking up to Jesus, and she knows that her condition will be healed if she only touches him. Touches the corner of his garment. Believing the scripture. That's, that's at least one way that people have read that the Malachi prophecy. So you've got that. You've got, uh, let me scroll down. <coughs> so you've got this woman. Uh, notice also, I think it's interesting, uh, and I'm not going to try and attach too much meaning to this, but the daughter is 12 years old and the woman has been bleeding for 12 years. I don't know if you noticed that. Um, things like that, are probably worthy of chasing down and seeing if there's something there. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not one that says every time a number is mentioned that there's significance, but these are two numbers that could have easily been left out or rephrased in a different way. She had bled for a long time, but that's not how he says it. He says 12 years, and so within a couple sentences, he says 12 twice. I'm not saying there's anything there or any hidden meaning, but it might be worthy of checking out. We do know that 12 is a complete number, uh, cosmologically. Uh, the, the worldly perspective of the cosmos uh, would have been, uh, you know, there's 12 zodiac signs, okay? The sun goes through a progression of 12 every, every year from a worldly perspective. And so 12, well, we see seven as a complete number as well, biblically. 12 is one of those numbers that worldwide would have been understood as a completeness or a complete number. All right. You got two blind men, uh, and then you've got a mute man. 
Uh, this last one, this last set of three, if you remember, uh, my premise is that it's about the spread of the gospel. I want to show you three places that you may have noticed in 926. This news spread throughout the land. This is after the first one. And then again in 931. And their eyes were open. Uh, sorry. Just a second. Getting a little bit ahead of myself. 926. Yeah, this news is spread. And then in 31, but they went out and spread the news about him throughout all that land. Do you see the, the commonality there? Throughout all the land. And then in uh, 31, throughout all the land. Okay. So that commonality in the way Matthew describes it. And then again in verse 33, after the last miracle, the crowds were amazed and were saying, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel, which is all the land. So... Um, you've gotten this last set of three miracles. You've got this enormous spread of the gospel. News is getting out. People that were told not to say anything are going and spreading the news, right? And that leads to the initial confrontation that we see in verse 34. The Pharisees were saying, he cast out demons by the ruler. So it's these miracles that are gathering people together and also causing division. And so we come out of this last two chapters, eight and nine, seeing not just a random assortment of Jesus' work, but we see a well-organized presentation of Jesus as a merciful Messiah, as Jesus as very deity himself, and that that news is impossible to keep corralled. It's getting out. And when it does, it will cause division. And so you know where we're headed if you haven't read the rest of the Gospels. We're headed to a great division, right? Yeah. Let me uh, just close uh, this last uh, couple verses. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. As you've seen in the last two chapters, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, Beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. And that's what the next chapter is all about. He's sending out his 12 to do more than he can do alone, sending them out and commissioning them to do that. That's what we'll cover in two weeks. Let me close in prayer and we'll be done for tonight. Dear God, thanks for a chance to kind of look at these two chapters. Look at uh, not just the words that you say, but the things that you're able to do and what that means about who you are. And God, uh, I, don't know, uh, I don't know where we find ourselves now, what, what needs to be healed in our lives, whether it's relationships or our, our physical bodies need to be healed or uh, our finances. or we, we have a lot of things that are temporal, that, that, that don't last very long, that need healing. And God, just help us not to be distracted on those things that won't last but really seek you for the, the healing that you offer the healing of our souls and we are all in need of that thank you for being that Messiah and that God in Jesus name Amen